we can always say, no matter what we're in, no matter what we've been through, whatever we're going to go through, it is well with my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you believe it, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Suzanne and worship team. Thanks, Tim. Thank you both as well for uh, standing in for me the last uh, what, three weeks now. And uh, appreciate it very much. Thanks, John, for mowing the grass out there. I was just going to wait and shovel it, but <laughs> praise the Lord. Appreciate it. And uh, so all of you are probably aware of the situation going on in my family. And I, I, the reason I wasn't here last week was not, it was more about me not wanting to make it about me if that makes any sense to you, because uh, it would have been difficult. And I'll probably talk about it a little bit this, this morning, just, just so you kind of have an idea of what's going on. But um, look, uh, my brother was a believer. He was very troubled. He had health issues, and obviously that led to some other mental and emotional issues as well. But um, he was a believer. He was born again. He attended the Saddleback Church there in Southern California, big uh, church there in Southern California. All of his uh, doctrines and theology didn't agree with mine, and we sometimes butted heads that way. He was a little bit more of a legalist, and in fact, quite a bit more. And we'd had a kind of a, a falling out over that. In fact, he got really mad at me and blessed me out, and because I was trying to talk to him about some of the things he was saying and how that, you know, it's all under the blood. It's all good. You know, just relax and move on. God wants to bless you and he's not punishing you. Your issues are not coming from God and so on and so forth. Anyway, he was really upset with me for a while. He called me a lot of names and brought up a bunch of stuff that uh, history, you know, things that I had done and so basically calling me a hypocrite for telling him that, you know, and I get it. I mean, that's not the first time it's ever happened and he wasn't the first one to say it so I, uh, it just, I just said it's all good, Jim. You know, it's just it's okay. And uh, so he didn't contact me then didn't, and wouldn't take my calls for about, I don't know, three or four months or something. And then all of a sudden he started texting me and calling and, and uh, emailing. In fact, the day before he took his life, I had an email from him just asking how we were and what was going on. If I had talked to my brother David, and I texted him back and just kind of tell him everything's fine here, hope everything's well with you. And the last words that I spoke were, I love you. Praise God. Praise God. So I'm grateful to God that I had that opportunity. Amen. And, uh, you know, we were brothers, so brothers sometimes disagree, but you never stop being brothers, you know. And I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to kind of, God must have dealt with him about some of the things that he had said. And I wasn't, I, Sally will tell you, I, I, was, I was angry when he took his life more than anything else. I thought it a selfish and cowardly act. It doesn't diminish my feelings for my brother. That's just what I think about suicide. And uh, especially as a believer, I was just hurt. You know, it's just, it, it, but at the same time, I told her that I can't get in his head. I don't know what was going on there. I don't know what he was dealing with, what demons he was trying to fight. So. You know, you just remember the best that you can remember and yes. thank God that he's with the Lord and he's yes. not being tormented anymore. He's, he's at peace, but we're left with the aftermath and that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the issue. So, that being said, praise the Lord. Thank God. Yes. It's all good in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, we just move on as if it were any other kind of situation. But, uh, you know, the Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And uh, I've consoled myself with the Word of God and with uh, good memories and with uh, a little humor, talking with my brother and my older sister. And, you know, it, sometimes the old cliche is true. It just is what it is, and you've got to deal with it. You just move on, right? So I want to tell you about a new uh, Japanese Jewish restaurant that's in town. You may, I don't know if any of you have been there yet or tried it, but you should. It's called Sosumi. <laughs> Speaking of Japanese, I'm still trying to figure out why kamikazes wore helmets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Come on, cheer up, guys. It's, it's okay. Praise the Lord. There, there's some sad news from Australia, though. The inventor of the boomerang grenade died today. <laughs> the groans, I'm appreciating the groans. That's what these are supposed to do. Praise the Lord. Sally made me go to a uh, ballet. I, I told you before, uh, my mother made all of us kids take dancing lessons and take a musical instrument when we were kids. Fortunately for me, I was able to do the ballroom thing, which was just basically I learned the box step and the two step, and that was good enough. You know, it looked, then you can make it look like you're doing whatever you're supposed to be doing, no matter what the dance is, right? But my two younger brothers had to take tap dancing lessons. Man, they, you know, we never let them forget that. We tormented them about that time. But anyway, Sally had me go to a ballet once, and, uh, and I'm thinking, this just, it does not make sense to me, you know? You see all these women dancing around on their tiptoes, and I'm thinking, why didn't they just get taller women? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, well, you survived the... Worse of it. Praise God. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. It's all good in Jesus. Praise the Lord. And uh, I want to talk to you about some things this morning. And, uh, you know, some of it's relative to what I just mentioned about my brother, but I'm not making it about him. I'm saying this is about everybody, but this is just what uh, bugs me about so many Christians. He was a Christian, but, I mean, he was living a life of bondage and, and fear and, and uh, condemnation and everything else. When God wanted to set him free, when God wanted him to be free. He's free now, and he's with the Lord, and it's all good. Amen. But he could have had a good life here. He could have had yeah. more here. Now, he was a, he was a well-to-do guy. I mean, uh, he always had a really good job. He was an executive in sales, and he made good money. He had a, at one point until they sold it, he and his wife were having some issues. They had a, over a million-dollar home in Costa Mesa, California. I mean, they were living the life. He drove a Porsche convertible, and... You know, on the outside, everything looks like, what could you ask for? You know, you got it all. And yet this other stuff goes on inside of people all the time, which just shows you that stuff just isn't the answer. That's right. If you got God, then the stuff is a blessing. It's, it's great. But if all you got is the stuff, it, it's, just, it's just more of a captor than something that sets you free. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to just preface this by saying, in the beginning... Adam was a man created in the image of God, and he was in a paradise, and he was living completely from God's supply. That is God's intent for man. We've been redeemed, not to just before the law, but all the way back to innocence, before Adam ever knew that there was such a thing as good or evil, just innocence, where God met every need, where God supplied all of his needs, where there was perfect relationship between God and man. That's what God intended for us. That's what we've been redeemed to. Not to some religion, not to a bunch of different rules, or not to some other uh, regimen, but we've been redeemed back to a perfect relationship with God where God wants to meet all of our needs. Yes. But it has to be by faith. Yes. Faith is the key to everything. Yes. When Adam stepped out of what God's promise was to him and said, well, you know, let's try the knowledge of good and evil and see how that works to make us like God, he was out of faith. He was no longer believing God. He was believing in what he could produce himself. Yeah. That's what created, and the Bible says, and that day, the day that you do this, you will die. And we say, well, he didn't die. He died as far as his relationship to God was concerned, as far as God being his source anymore. He died to that because now God says, now by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to produce this stuff. God didn't kill him because of it. But God said, if you're not going to allow me, if you're not going to live by faith, if you're not going to trust me to be your source, then as far as that relationship with us is concerned, it's over. Now it's up to you. You've got to produce. You have to do it. All right? So let me, let's begin here, Peter, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And verse 21. And we talk about faith all the time and believing in God. But I'm telling you, there's so much more to this that we need to discipline ourselves. If there's any discipline at all, that's the discipline. Because I hear all the time from people that 
Why didn't God do this? Why hasn't God done this? Why, why doesn't this happen? Why haven't I got this breakthrough? Why haven't I got that thing? I can tell you why. Because you're not believing. Amen. You say, well, I do believe. I have believed. Yeah, you believe when you're not believing. You know what I'm saying? When you're not believing, you're not believing. Exactly. And then you'll believe for a little while, but then you're back in unbelief again. Then you're back in no faith. Yeah. And that cuts you off from the supply. Yes. It's that simple. This, is not, this isn't really uh, deep intellectual stuff. It's just being willing to believe what God has said. Amen. Everything we talked about here this morning, all the testimony that I've heard, Don, what Don said, what Tim was saying. I mean, it's, this is the truth. So... He says that your days may be multiplied. Now, if you read prior to this, and I didn't just for the sake of time, it's just talking about keeping the, the law, keeping the commandments. And he said, do this so that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land where you've got houses that are already built, the, land, the place where everything's already provided. Lord, swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Amen. All right, look at verse 22 and 23 now, Peter. So this is the old covenant now, remember. Mm -hmm. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you will possess greater nations and mightier nations than yourself. So God says, I want to give you this. I want to give you heaven on earth. I want to be your source. But you've got to keep the commandments in order for me to do it. This is Old Covenant, right? All right, Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up to us to up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Praise the Lord. So the provision is contingent upon you keeping the law. I'm being a little redundant here, but I just want to get the point across. That's what God wants under this, you've got to do something. You've got to keep a, a, the covenant. You've got to keep the commandments in order for God to be able to give you heaven on earth, to be able to be your source. Amen? All right, look at Romans chapter 10 now, 10 and verse 4. And I've talked about this a little bit before, but you, you can see the wording here. So he's talking about the commandment, right? In Deuteronomy here, he's talking about is the commandment up here, you've got to go to heaven and get it. Is it down beneath the sea, you've got to get it. Where do you, how are you going to get the commandment? It's nigh you, it's in your mouth. So, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Do you believe it? He is the end of the, the demand of you keeping the commandment, amen, for everybody. That's the truth for everybody that believes. There's no more commandment to keep. He's the end of the law. For everyone, as far as righteousness is concerned, in other words, put it back in right standing with God, He is the end of the demand for you to do anything for that to happen. Right. He has made you righteous yes. if you believe that He fulfilled all that. Amen? So Christ met the criteria, in other words, so that you can have the days of heaven on earth. Yes. Praise the Lord. Verse uh, 5 through 8 now, Peter. Because he's going to use the very same words to solidify this truth. He says, For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? Now before, in Deuteronomy, they're talking about the law, about the commandment. Now they're talking about Jesus, but he's using the very same words. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of what Moses was talking about. Yes. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So faith replaces. It's just, I mean, it's not complicated. Faith replaces performance as far as the new covenant is concerned. Yes. Amen? 
All right, Romans chapter 10, 9 through 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Or disappointed is another word for that. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise the Lord. So the promised land or heaven on earth is in reach of every born again believer. Everybody that is a believer in God. Yes. That's what the scripture is telling us. And it's by faith. Moses asked for two things. He asked to see the glory of God and to see the promised land. Amen? On the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses sees both in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen? He sees the glory of God. He sees the promised land. Yes. The reality, you know, it, is that it wasn't acreage someplace in the Middle East. It was God himself in the flesh. Yeah. That's the promised land that we now have. Uh, you can't, in a way, this is, it's personal, but it's not personal because it's, it's true for everybody. But everybody thinks their situation is unique. Everybody thinks my situation is worse. Or why isn't God doing this for me? Because you see somebody else got blessed or somebody else had a breakthrough or somebody else got this thing or you, and, and you haven't seen it for yourself. That is the height of arrogance and egotism. God is not a respecter of persons. Amen. If somebody else got something that you didn't get, they do, did something that you didn't do. Yeah. Amen? They believed. Yes. And they kept on believing. Yes. In spite of the fact that it didn't look like it was ever going to come to pass. Right. Think about healings. Think about deliver, a financial breakthrough. I don't care what it is. It all works the same thing. God is wanting to be the source, but there's only way for, one way for Him to be the source, and that's for you to believe and to continue to believe. There isn't a timeline on any of this. Nope. So, look, Einstein said this. Now, he had a lot of different theories. But one, of the, one was he was sitting a, on a bus one day, and as he was traveling towards the, the main part of town, he could see the clock. And he had this thought that if I could go fast enough, I could get there before the clock makes the next tick, right? And if I could go even faster, I could get there before the clock even got to where it is right now. Now, not many people think that way, but that's yeah. the way his mind worked. That's how he worked out the theory of relativity. That's how he got the uh, energy and mass, you know, all these things that we think of today as being, well, I mean, it's, it's like time travel. We were talking about the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> Apparently, these people are very brilliant, you know. I mean, they're ingenious. But he, he, Einstein said this. He said, the past... The present and the future are all happening at the very same time. It's only an illusion that makes it seem like it's separate. Amen? So what you believed yesterday, in that context, this is what I'm seeing. What you believed yesterday determines your today. Do you understand what I'm saying? What you believe today is going to determine your tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Look, think of this. Ephesians 2.6 says, You are seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, if we're not thinking God thoughts, if we're not thinking the way God thinks, and the way, which is what makes Einstein's such a brilliant thing, is because it's God thought is what it amounts to. Yeah, it Outside of time, where time doesn't control anything anymore. But he's saying... This very thing is being substantiated in Ephesians 2.16. You are seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if we're not thinking spiritually, we're thinking, no, not yet. I mean, someday I will be. No, you are now because whatever in the future is already now as far as God's concerned. Outside of time, it's already now. And unless you start thinking spiritually, you're stuck with the natural. 
You're stuck with something off in the far distant future or maybe never because you can't get your head wrapped around it. John 3, uh, 12 and 13 is another example. And this is Jesus talking about Jesus himself. Who is God in the flesh? Who defied everything that is natural? I mean, he's born of a woman. The seed of a woman. A woman doesn't have seed. Right? She has an egg. She has, you know, over. So it's, it, he's showing us your, your biology ain't going to work here. Your natural way of thinking doesn't affect what God really does and how He does it. You've got to change the natural way of thinking in order to understand or comprehend. And that's why Mary was so brilliant, probably wasn't educated at all. She was a young girl in those days. They didn't have school. They didn't get to go to school. They did, the only education they got was handed down from mom to daughter, right? right? And yet she was brilliant and wise enough to say, be it unto me, even as you have spoken. And that was good enough for God. That was a Ph.D. in theology. Yeah. So if I have told you earthly things, Jesus is talking. Did, did you see he said John, if I, John 3 or John 2? John 3. Okay. You're right. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Right. Now, he's talking to people who don't have the spirit. So he's trying to. That's why he dumbs everything down to parables and all to try to get them to understand spiritual truth. And no man has ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. This is the Son of Man that's talking to him. Yeah. Now, if you think they weren't confused before he said this, yeah. now he's giving them a little hint about why you won't understand spiritual things because it is totally a flip on everything you're already understanding. Uh -huh. You've got to be willing to move into what God says and believe that in spite of what all your history and all your education and everything uh, experiences have told you. He said... Nobody has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So he's saying the same thing that he said in Ephesians 2. He's saying the same thing that Einstein said. Uh -huh. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, they're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. You would say, oh, he once was in heaven, but then he came down to earth. And Jesus just flips the whole pie chart by saying, yeah, I came down from heaven. Because I was already in heaven and still am. Yeah. 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 All right, now look, look, look at this. Hebrews chapter 11. See, you're not, you're, we, we're trying to get things from God in a natural way. Sure. And religion has, has made that an issue. I mean, it's even added to that by saying, well, you just need to pray more. Mm. You just need to quit doing that, right? And then you'll get, and that's, that's not it. You are dead. Yeah. Your sins don't exist. And you are alive in Christ. Yeah. That's the reality. But we know we struggle with that every day, multiple times a day. Sure. If I'm dead, then why is this junk still going on? Why did this happen? Why did I do that? Why did I think that? Why did I say this? Yeah. Because you're thinking in the natural. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Even though you're walking down yeah. University Avenue. Right? Yeah. If I've told you earthly things, okay? So look at Hebrews 11, and we'll read verse 1. Hebrews 11, 1. And we all know it. We look at it all the time. But faith, now faith. Now faith. You see, faith only works in the now. Faith is a God thing. It doesn't work in the future. It doesn't work in the past. Faith is for the moment. For the, it's outside of time, in other words. Yeah. And what we do is we force it into time, and that way we can say, well, I've had faith, but this didn't happen. No, you, you just by that, saying that, you've told me you don't have faith. That's right. You're talking about intellectual understanding of something that God never meant for us to get into necessarily intellectually. So he said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, yeah. the evidence of things not seen. Now, if that isn't a picture of something outside of time, I don't know what it is. Yeah. But look at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Now, that's that also tra translated is also uh, the rapture. It's also referred to as the rapture. It's another translation of translated. 
by faith, Enoch was raptured so that he would not see death and was not found because God had raptured him before his translation, he had this testimony. Before he was raptured, he had this testimony. He pleased God. How do you please God? There's only one way to please God, by faith. He believed in something that was not yet happened. Was not for his time. Was not, it wasn't going to be for thousands of years later. It hasn't happened yet in, you know, in the way that he's speaking of it here. So the rapture wasn't for his time, but he believed in things that were not and said, I'll take it now. He wasn't bothered by when it was supposed to happen. He said, it's going to happen, and I'm not, I don't have to be bound by time, so I'll just take mine now. He believed God. See what I'm saying? He had such faith in, the, in God saying there's going to be this rapture. And he's thinking, well, there's going to be. I might as well have part of it now because I don't have to wait. It's, not, it's a faith thing and it's not, it's not confined to time. You don't have to wait four or 5,000 years in order to participate in this. If you can believe, it pleases God and God gives it to you. You see what I'm saying? Because it isn't a question of getting God to do it. God's already done it. It's your faith that accesses it. Yes. Amen. Yes. And faith is not in time. Otherwise, you won't access. Right. Hope is what is in time. Hope is to lead you to faith. Yes. And you hope against the natural. You hope against hope. In other words, you hope against what you can see naturally should take place, and that will take you into faith, which is outside of time, which is where all this stuff is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Amen? Yes. That's the genius of Einstein. Energy, matter. He's saying this stuff doesn't even really exist, yeah. except through your natural eyes. Yes. It's all just molecules. It's all just atoms. It's all just quarks. It's just all this energy. The only reason it has mass is because we see it here. We're here in time. Uh -huh. But if you could speed up your time, in other words, if you could get yourself out of time, this would just disappear. Yeah. Now, what do you think happens when we get raptured or yeah. when we die? Yeah. You're immediately in the yes. presence of the Lord. Yes. You don't have to go anywhere for that. Exactly. You just don't. This just yes. disappears. Wow. Praise the Lord. That's why our loved ones are not sitting up there twiddling their thumbs, wringing their hands, wondering, when is he coming? Yeah. <laughs> no, they're not. Time is not even an issue. They're not. It'll just, there, there. Yes. In the blink of an eye. Yes. In the twinkling of an eye. And it'll be that way when we get there. They'll say, Amen. hallelujah. Did you miss me? Miss you. Wow. Where you been? Verse 5, again, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him or raptured him. Before his rapture, he had this testimony, he pleased God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, which tells me the way you please God is by believing. Yes. That's all he did. Yes. He believed God. And he got something that we think of being thousands of years in the future. He got it right then. Yeah. Amen. He yes. stepped out of time and into faith. Yes. It's exactly what Don was talking about. Awesome. See, sometimes you get an instantaneous healing. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. I mean, because your faith is there for the moment. Mm -hmm. Other times, he says, they, and they were healed. As they went. So it's a gradual thing. Why? Because their faith was growing as they were seeing yeah. evidence yeah. of the natural yeah. being set aside for the supernatural. Yes. Doesn't make it any. If they could have had the faith all at once, right? But how can you, when you've got all the evidence coming against you, constant doctor's reports, the lawyers, the, 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 you know, the, the bank, the, the whatever, your spouse, the, the situation. So sometimes it's just hoping against hope and you see some light at the tunnel yes. and then it gets brighter and brighter yes. until you have the fullness yes. of whatever it was. And all it was was getting you out of the thinking uh -huh. in time. All right, Hebrews 10, 35 
And we'll go through 11.1 again. So Hebrews 10, 35 to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Now, think about these scriptures as we read them. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, he's talking both worlds. He's talking time, and he's talking faith. He's talking outside of time, right? But he's using their understanding of time to help them understand faith. Patience. You've got you to have patience. You've got to, right. you know, you can't let your natural man dictate how it's going to happen. Right. How it will, when it will happen and what, you know what I'm saying? You can't lay out a timeline for faith. So now the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Yes. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But look at this. He, back up if you would again, Peter. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here if I'm not confusing you. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence or your faith in whatever it is that God has promised, right? Because there's a great reward. There's a great uh, fulfilling of that promise. But you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, which is believing and trusting God, you'll receive the promise. Amen. For yet a little while. Now look what he says. A little while. Now he's talking time. Sounds like, right? And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. It's like a contradiction. Yeah. In a little while, but he's actually saying in a little while, you'll find out he's always been here all along. Yeah. Like he's not going to tarry. You're, you're waiting for something that's already there. Do you, you, understand, you see what I'm saying? Yes. Now the just will live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition or into unbelief. But of them that believed to the saving of the soul. How did they believe? They believed it was done. The moment you agreed to it, it was already done. It was all finished, right? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So let me just say it to you the way God said it to me. We don't wait by faith. We live by faith. And we've flipped this thing over to where I'm waiting by faith. If you're waiting by faith, you'll be waiting 30 years from now. Yes. Yes. Because waiting implies time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. But now faith wow. is now. Yes. It's, it's now. See, the just are the, are the justified or the, those that have been made righteous, been put back into right standing with God. The righteousness of God in Christ, right? All right, Romans 1.17. You see, the renewing of our mind is more about this yes, it than it is about memorizing Scripture. Yes. I'm not saying we shouldn't memorize Scripture. I'm just saying it's trying to change the way that we think so that we can get the benefit of what God has done for us. Yes. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, what does religion tell us? That you'll become righteous eventually if you are good enough. If you do all the right stuff. Because if you don't, you're going to fall out of righteousness. And God's going to mess with you. That's faith in time. That's, fa that's faith in me. That's faith in my effort. That's not even faith. It's just what we've called it. Sure. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Yes. Yes. You live by faith. You're not waiting by faith. You're living by faith. And if you're living by faith, you're not seeing stuff off in the future. You're saying, I have it, even if he hasn't appeared yet. Just exactly what God was talking about healing. Yes. See, Doke's confession's got to be, I'm healed. And that's what he's been saying. And the, the reality of that is filtering through the natural realm, amen, to show us what already exists. Yes. The challenge is for us to stay in faith, yes. to live by faith, not wait by faith, yes. but live by faith. Yes, that's good. Your substance, look at Hebrews 1 again, 11.1, 1, excuse me. Now faith 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, by definition, your substance is determined by staying in faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not just about believing for something until you see it, right? Because it's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. If you keep waiting on the manifestation, and I'm not saying, I get the, the intellectual side of this, but he's saying faith is saying I already have it. That's the substance. The substance, amen, is determined by staying in faith. So if you're in faith or you're not in faith, the substance never really manifests. Faith is now. It's not in time. Am I making sense? Because if you're, if you're waiting, you know, if you're anticipating that way, thinking that way, that's not faith. That's hope. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of what you can't see when you're hoping for. It moves you out of time into the spirit. Into the God realm. All right, let me, let me show you that. Mark 11, verse 22 through 24. And see, Jesus is showing us this over and over and over. But because we approach it from this religious and, and academic and kind of intellectual way of thinking about things, we're always missing it by a little bit. And it looks crazy. Well, everything I'm saying sounds crazy if you're thinking from a, you know, from a time perspective, from a natural perspective. But Jesus answers them and he says, have faith in God. That actually translates, have the God kind of faith, which is the faith that you have. That's what you received when we got Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. And then he tells you how the God kind of faith works. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have Whatever he says. Yes. Therefore, I say to you, what things soever you desire when you pray, look, believe that you receive them. Believe that you got them. And you will have them. Yeah. If you're believing for them to come down the road at some point when everything lines up, when the stars align, you know, and when you get your act together and everything, it ain't going to happen. Right. You've got to believe that you got it when you said it. Amen. So it's not as simple as we thought it was. Actually, it is quite simple. It's just so contradictory. It's so counterintuitive to everything we're taught and understand as humans. Yeah. Yeah. God kind of... Either... Look. Something I learned a long time ago. Either life happens to you or you happen to life. You're either a victim... Or the victor. Right. Didn't take me long in life to figure that out. Because crap happens. You do stupid stuff. Stupid stuff happens. Amen. You have to make a choice at some point, And that's really what Christianity is all about. Moving you from being the victim to be the victor. Instead of life happening to you. You are now a happening to life. You're, ha you're changing things. You're, yes. Life isn't controlling you. You're controlling life. Yes. Amen. God. I mean he made a big deal out of this. For us to have this kind of life. It's heaven on earth. Yeah. It's God sourcing. It's not, it's not a, what we can do or can't do. It's just what we can believe. Yes. Alright, John chapter 16, verse 7 through 11. See, it, it takes a radical change of the way that we think if we're going to get the radical results that God has promised. We can't keep stumbling through life as natural men thinking we're going to get supernatural results. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you, or it's to your benefit, that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Comforter of the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But if I go, I'll send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. All right, you want to know what sin is? Sin is not going out and getting high. Sin is not messing with somebody else's wife. I'm not saying, do, don't do this stuff. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying that's not what, how God defines sin. No. He defines sin as unbelief in Him. Yeah. 
Because that's all you have to do to be delivered from sin is to believe. Yeah. Why? Because now you're not going to believe anymore. Now you believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Yeah. The sin, I've said this before, but adultery, drunkenness, uh, drugs, whatever it might be, those are horizontal sins. They're sins against one. God has settled the sin issue between me and Him. But it doesn't mean there aren't consequences for sin because if I mess around with somebody else, I got some issues when I come home. Yeah. Amen? And even if I don't care if I lose my wife, I lose my grandchildren. I lose the relationship with the children. Yes. I, I, all, everything goes squirrely. Yeah. Right? Yes. And if I want to drink, I can drink. But if I want to drink till I'm drunk all the time and it messes up all my relationships and I can't keep a job and I'm feeling guilty and ashamed all the time because of it, it's God and me are still good. But everything else is going to hell in a handbasket because I'm sinning against people. And that's why the Bible says if somebody sins against you, forgive them as God has forgiven you. Yeah. It's the message of reconciliation. Yeah. God says, you want to be like me? Yeah. Forgive them yeah. when they don't deserve forgiveness. Yes. Yes. Just forgive them anyway. Give them grace yes. as I gave it to you. That's not an easy thing. True. Praise the Lord. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. All right? We were judged in Christ. In other words, our sin, our, our rebellion against God was judged in Jesus. The prince of this world is Satan. And he was judged and as being who we were before we were born again, right? So unbelief is sin. Uh -huh. And sin is unbelief. It's that simple. There is, there's not a whole list. It isn't the Ten Commandments, church. It's unbelief. Yes. It's, it's that simple. If you're not in faith, you're in sin. Anything that is not of faith is sin. Yes. Right? And we, we've done that down to me. Well, if I don't feel guilty for getting drunk, then it, it's not sin. No, it isn't anyway. The sin is not believing yes. that it's all been dealt with. Yes. Now, if I don't believe that it's been dealt with, then it's still sin because I'm in unbelief. Yeah. Okay, so you say, okay, well then what does that mean? I want to show you. What it, what it means is this, and I'll get ahead of myself a little bit, but when God said, the day you eat of it, you will die. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh -huh. Did Adam die? No, not for a 1,500 years or something. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but a long time. What changed was God no longer was his source. He now had to work it out for himself. The day, the moment you don't believe God, you're stuck with you. You're stuck with what you can produce. That's sin. You die to the promise. You die to the resource. Am I... You understand what I'm saying? That's what he told Adam, and, and we're there. That's what we deal with. We die to the, to the manifestation of whatever that promise was when we're in unbelief. Yes. We're in sin. Why will God not allow sin into his presence? Unbelief. God is a faith God. He's a now God. He doesn't, he doesn't know unbelief. He's not connected with it. Right. First Corinthians 15, verse 45 through 47. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now remember, we were in Adam, mm -hmm. and then we were redeemed, to Jesus, the second Adam. Amen. So you got these, this contradiction going on, right? Howbeit he that was not of the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Now the part of you that's still carnal is your mind. But your mind is what drives every other part of your right. body. And so if your mind isn't renewed to the spirit, it will operate as though you're still an Adam. Yeah. And you get the results of unbelief. You get the results of uh, death and uh -huh. to the resources of God. So you have to have your mind renewed 
right? To the spirit so that you are in the second Adam or the Adam who was totally trusting in God, completely complicit to anything and everything God wanted to do. So the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. Praise the Lord. So two men. You got the first man. You got the second man. Look at verse uh, 48 and 49. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Praise the Lord. So we've got... Two images. We, we, we have borne the image of the earthly, and we also bear the image of the heavenly, because yeah. we're born again. All right, Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 12 through 17. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What do we say sin was? Everybody was in unbelief until they came to believe. Nobody was born a believer. So therefore, as by we were born in Adam. So wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, or separation from God and his resources and all the benefits that he has for us and everything that he promised us, heaven on earth, right? So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we know that we weren't all stillborn, Right? We were born dead to the resources of God or to the relationship with God. Why? Because we were in unbelief. We had to come to a place of faith. Because all of sin, we were in unbelief. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. So the law came because man had found out that there is good and evil. Right? And God wants to magnify that so that they will be forced to come to him. Right? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So even for those who didn't rebel against God, because they were in Adam, they couldn't connect with God. So they were still in unbelief. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God... How many of you know it's the grace of God... The love of God that draws men to repentance or to change their mind about God or to believe in God. So, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Praise the Lord. Not as it was by the one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive, how do you receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness? By believing. Shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Or shall have the resources given to them from God. They reign in life. They, they rule over this world. In other words, you got heaven on earth. The just shall live by faith. So to this day, there's a struggle within us. Even though we are not the old man, our mind still wants to think like the old man. Even though as far as God's concerned, we are redeemed. That's why we have people that could commit suicide. That people that could go out and commit other crimes and, that, and yet still be a believer. Uh -huh. Why? Because their mind hasn't caught up with their spirit. Yeah. They're struggling with that separation from God and, 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 and saying, if I could just do something more, I could be like God. No, you were created in His image. Uh -huh. Alright, Romans chapter 7, 17 through 25. Now then, it is no more I that do it. This is Paul. But sin that dwells in me. He's, he's a saved guy. Right? He's, and yet he's seeing what we all see in ourselves. Yeah. And he's trying to figure it out. And in doing so, he's relaying to us how this works. It, 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 then it, it's no more I that do, do, do it, but that sin that dwells in me or unbelief. 
right? For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, there's no good thing. For to will is present, but how to perform that which is good, I can't figure it out. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. How many can say, praise the Lord, amen, that happens, you know? The very thing I don't want to do is I end up doing it and then I'm condemned and, you know. Now, if I do that, if I do that, I would not. Or if I do what I don't want to do, it's, what I found out is, this is what Paul is relaying to us, it's not me that's doing it anymore. It's unbelief that dwells in me. I find then there's a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. In other words, when I want to believe God and do what God says, there is unbelief. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, after the spirit, after the second Adam. But I see there's another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of unbelief, which is in my members, which is the Adamic nature or the old Adam who didn't believe God, and that's why they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of unbelief. See, there's this, there is an inner struggle between the Adam nature and the Christ nature, the soul and the spirit, unbelief and faith. Amen? The songs that we sing this morning, what are we saying? We're saying have faith, right? If you can believe God, all things are possible. This too shall pass. I'll make all things work together for good, right? That's the battle. The battle isn't with the problem. The battle is with faith or unbelief. Yes. Uh-huh. Faith man, the spirit man, the carnal man, the carnal nature, or the Christ nature. Romans 8 and 1, very next verse, he says, I thank God, okay, but there is therefore now no condemnation or no judgment, Right? To them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Or you could say, who walk after faith, or after, who walk not after unbelief, but after faith. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of unbelief and death. Yes. You've been delivered from it, right? But you've got to know it. You've got to live by faith. Praise the Lord. Romans 6 and 11. So, you know, that's why we say confession, confession, confession. It's it's just, it it isn't a trick. It isn't a gimmick. It's a way of renewing your mind. You know, enough repetition, and and it becomes second nature to you. It becomes, you react to things from that position. But if you're caught between two. That's why a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't think that he can get anything from God. If you're in, in faith one moment and unbelief the next, you're screwed. Yeah. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto unbelief. Make up your mind. But alive unto God or alive to God's faith yes. through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where it came from. Let not Unbelief, therefore, reign in your mortal body that you would obey it in the lust thereof. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Uh, what is there? No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, look. Sin is unbelief. It isn't. Stuff. It isn't things you do. It's belief or unbelief. I said I've talked about this before, but the biggest see the biggest what the devil does to us is he makes he makes us into schizophrenic Christians. Yes. Amen. We're you know we're we're split personalities. Yes. We know it in our own life. One minute I've got the faith to move mountains. The next minute, I can't muster up enough faith to 
to get through an argument with my wife to think that this too shall pass. Right? Yeah. We're just going, oh my God. It's never going to get any better. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it, it shows up in our words, in our confessions, uh-huh. in our acts, acts with a T, and our responses to other people's acts. And those things change constantly and unpredictably. See, that's why Tim said it so good. We have two ears and one mouth. And Sally will tell you, there's a lot of times I don't say much around the house because things I'm thinking right. that if I said it, yeah. it ain't going to be good. I know when I'm thinking them, you're just being selfish. You're just being, you know, self-centered. You're just, you know, she's been reupholstering repul- chairs. See, I'm kind of a, a bit of a neat freak. I'm not a, as obsessive compulsive as I once was, but uh, our house has turned into a shop, you know. Yeah. It just drives me crazy. Uh-huh. And I used to harp about it all the time. Anytime everything wasn't where it was supposed to be, I'd... Now I just kind of go around and I'll maybe move a few things myself you know, go straight. But I don't say anything anymore. Why? Because, look, I know it's as much about me being compulsive as it is about her trying. She's trying to do something. Yes. Right? Yes. She's, she's saving me a bunch of money. Yeah. And I'm going to harp about because everything's not in its place. So uh-huh. it's not what I think. It's what I say that gets me into trouble. Amen. So we've got the ability to display both faith and unbelief, both good and evil. But that's why he says to set a watch over your tongue, because you're liable to say crap that isn't spiritual, because you've got the ability, and we know that we have. We can be the most loving, doting, caring, and the most hateful and hard to get along with and you know what I mean? Yes. It's in a, it, we, we have the capacity to do it. Yes. What I'm trying to get across is that, look, God's judgment on Adam means everybody that lives in Adam dies to the resources of the kingdom. They die to the benefits yes. of what God has for them. So just thinking spiritually you're either going to get God's resources or you're stuck with yours. Yeah. That's, the, that's the bottom line. Those that are in Christ are made alive. Right? Yes. Now you have the access again. You have what Adam had before he rebelled against God, before he didn't believe God. The day you eat of it, you're going to die. But the day... You confess Christ, you're back in this paradise. You're back in heaven on earth. You're back to the place where God is your source again. If you can believe, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. See, here's the deal. God's judgment is not against individuals. Mm -hmm. God wants to destroy and rebuke sin. Mm -hmm. Unbelief. That's what he's after. He's not out to try to punish a people, individuals. He's trying to get the human race back into faith, back into a relationship with him, back into a place where we can walk with him and talk with him and hear his voice and have confidence that he's going to supply my needs according to his riches and glory. He wants to free us from the bondage of corruption or the bondage of unbelief. so that we can operate in the nature of Christ, which is faith in God. What does Satan do? He comes to tell you that God's withholding something from you, and it's your fault. If you would just do this, you can get whatever it is you're after. Uh When in fact, it's putting you on the opposite track. Instead of operating in the old, unregenerated nature, 
that it, it, it tells us that it opposes and exalts itself above all that God has called. Amen. God is my shield, my exceeding great reward, my buckler, my strength. Yes, the lifter on my head. Exactly. Amen. But the moment I make it about me, I have just tried to elevate myself above him. I've said that I can do something that God can't do mm. or something God won't do. Mm. All right. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. So God says, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, has God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In other words, he's, getting, he's trying to get her to question what he actually said. And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you won't die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. Praise the Lord. Look at 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4. Now keep this in mind, what we just read. Beloved, believe not every spirit... But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Mm -hmm. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist that goes all the way back to the garden. Mm -hmm. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children. He's, he's saying what God had told Adam. And have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Praise the Lord. So, what is your spirit confessing? Mm -hmm. Right? That's what basically what God was asking Adam and Eve to confess what he had said. And what did Satan do? He tried to get them to confess something other than that. So, are you confessing that Jesus has come into your flesh or not? See, this is faith. Uh -huh. Unbelief says, man, I haven't acted like I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. That, that, that thought doesn't originate with you. It comes from the enemy to say, look, if you would just do this, then you'd be like Jesus. Uh -huh. When God is saying, you are already exactly like Jesus. You are redeemed. You are righteous. You have access to the entire inheritance. You are a joint heir of heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, John 20, uh, verse 25 to 27. This is just, just an example, but it goes on and on and on. Uh, after the crucifixion and resurrection, their talk, Thomas says, they said, hey, we've seen the Lord. He's risen, and he said, yeah, right. Well, I'll believe it when I can stick my hand in his side and touch the nail holes in his hands, right? Thrust my hand in his side. Thomas with him. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you, verse 27. And then said Thomas, he, he, Jesus said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust into my side and be not faithless, but believing. So from the very beginning of Christianity, not just from the garden, but the beginning of the redemption, uh -huh. God has been dealing with Christianity and their unbelief. It's not a new thing in the 2018. We're seeing repetitious behavior of Christians that Jesus was trying to deal with on a couple of days after his resurrection. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, uh, all, all Scripture is of God. Amen? All Scripture is breathed of God is actually the way, the literal translation. Amen? 
Every scripture is given by inspiration of God, or as God breathed, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's God breathed. All scripture. Since every scripture is God breathed, or the word of God, then it was with man, it's about sin or unbelief. That's the war. The war isn't you trying to get control over an addiction. The war is you trying to get control over your unbelief. People are going crazy because they can't do everything that they think they're supposed to do as a Christian when in fact those are, not, those are non-issues to God. <clears throat> to God, He's concerned about will you believe or not believe? Yes. It's sin or faith. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Alright, you don't have to go there, Peter, but for the sake of time, Revelation 1.16 talks about the, the, the image, you know, uh, it's a revelation of Jesus, obviously, and out of His mouth comes a two-edged sword. Right? The Word of God. Because in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, it talks about uh, the, the sword of the Spirit and how, it's how you defeat the enemy. The enemy's unbelief. It can come in many ways, but that's the problem. So how do we defeat the man of sin or the unbelief in our lives? You war through the one whose name is called the Word of God. You war through this. Yeah. You always go back to this. Uh, again, Tim, Tim said this morning, we have a name that's above every name. Cancer's got a name. Well, we got a name that's above cancer. We got a name that's above poverty. We've got a name that's above whatever the issue is that you're dealing with. We have a name that's above that. All you got to do is go back to the Word of God. That's His name. Yes. And He's called the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. The one with the two-edged sword coming out of His mouth. It'll slay the unbelief. It'll slay the old Adam. Yes. Amen? Mm-hmm. Ephesians 6, 13. He says, uh, when you've done all to do, stand therefore. Right? Well, standing is simply resting or trusting, thanking, believing, amen, whatever God said. That's how you stand. You don't stand by gritting your teeth and then running around asking somebody, why did this happen or why didn't that happen? You stand on what God said, and you thank God for what He said, and you stay in faith, you keep believing what God said, you rest in it, you trust in it. That's all, that's what you, that's living by faith. Every day is the time when, look, He says, stand therefore in the face of evil, in the day of evil. All right, so we know what standing is. It's, trust, it's just trusting God and believing God and saying what God says, right? So what's the evil day? That's the time when all the crap hits the fan. Yeah. That's the time when we face uncertainty. It's the time when we face contradictions, things that come and, and, and try to tell you that that isn't what God said. That's right. It's knowing God is working in the unseen on our behalf. Yes. Amen? But it's only by faith. It's the only way that it will work. Praise the Lord. Quickly, I'll get through here. 1 Samuel 17, 48, and I'll actually read that. David runs to Goliath, right? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. It's uh, verse uh, 48, 17, 48. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. David hastened or ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. So God's got a question for us. And it's, are we going to run from things or run to things? See, the giant's not going to get smaller by running away from it. Things don't typically get, see, procrastination, yeah, it can be a fun thing on, you know, if you get something you don't want to do. But the truth is, things don't simply get easier later on. Exactly. So bite the bullet. Face the giant now. Amen? Yes. Why? Because we don't wait by faith. We live by faith. Right. If you think you're just going to wait and it'll go away, yeah. at some point you're going to have to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Praise the Lord. 
We're wanting to know why. Why is it this happening? Well, why haven't you done anything? Why haven't you stepped up to face the giant? And here, look, remember, David's brother said, hey, here comes that little brat. He's a smart mouth and he thinks he knows everything. And he's, he ain't nothing. He's a sheep herder. He's taking care of a few sheep for, for our dad. And who, now who's he think he is telling us, you know, what we should be doing? They pointed out all of his flaws. They found the weakness and what they thought they could show him as being a jerk, you know, or a, a nothing. And that's exactly what the devil does. There's something wrong with you, you know. You got a problem. You, you, there's something wrong with you. Actually, there's something really seriously wrong with you. Right? Otherwise, otherwise you'd be having breakthroughs. Right? Otherwise, you'd be having all these encounters that you see other people having. You know, you'd, you'd be, you know, having visions and all that stuff. Of course there's something wrong with you. I mean, that's why Jesus died for us. Get over it. Trust God. Realize you're misunderstanding how you receive from God. We've been taught, in Pentecost especially, you receive by feelings instead of by faith. If I get the goosebumps... If I get, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm not saying they won't witness things, but I'm saying if you're waiting for a feeling, you may be waiting until hell freezes over before you get your manifestation. It isn't feelings we're supposed to be dealing with. It's faith. Yeah. You've got to believe that you are being powerfully touched yes. even if you're feeling nothing, even if it looks like God could care less and is a million miles away. Yes. Your flesh is going to try to get you into a struggle. Mm -hmm. But until you become alive to Christ, the Word of God, mm -hmm. the Spirit man, you're in sin. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to receive anything from God. Quickly, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. See, I've been off for three weeks. I've got to try to cram everything. Three oh. messages into one, I guess. Praise the Lord. Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they, but they thought to do me mischief, and I sent messages unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? They're trying to repair the walls of Jerusalem, reestablish temple worship. That's what they're after here. And so he says, Sanballat and Geshem sent to him, saying, Come down, come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. So Nehemiah is being asked to meet with his enemies in the valley of Ono to discuss things. Mm -hmm. Now I think Ono would have been a dead giveaway to me right off the bat. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think I want to go there. But look, even though Nehemiah is, in fact if you read the scripture they said that when they first saw the the, the temple after they restored it, people wept. Not because they were so happy, but because it was so pathetic looking compared to what it had been before the destruction. Right? So he says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come. Yeah. He sees his focus as a God thing, and I'm not coming down to talk to you and listen to your crap. He has established such a focus on the fact that I'm doing a great work. I got something good going on here. That he didn't have room or the time to play mind games with the enemy. Our enemy is constantly inviting us to meet with him in valleys of oh no. The flesh, the natural mind, the carnal mind, unbelief. That's what he's always doing. Uh -huh. I won't have you turn there for the sake of time. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 talks about building a, a man building his house on sand and a man building his house on rock. Yeah. See, God gave us the freedom to build our lives on rock uh -huh. or on sand. You can choose to do things your way. Mm -hmm. Sand or do it God's way, rock. Uh -huh. In other words, have faith or unbelief. Uh -huh. 
unbelief, or faith. It, the scripture says if you're born again, reckon the old man, the flesh, to be dead. And you, who you really are, to be alive to Christ. John 5 and 4 says that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So if you're giving up on your hopes, your dreams, your promises, just because you haven't seen them yet, you're not living by faith. You're waiting by faith. The substance you're looking for is determined by staying in faith and not going to the valley of Ono and confessing all the stuff that the enemy is trying to get you to confess. Your old nature, your earthly nature wants life to happen to you. Your born again heavenly nature wants you to happen to life. You be the victor. Whatsoever you say yeah. shall come to pass. So I'm just asking you this morning to determine to be a happening. Praise the Lord. Make it happen. Live by faith. Discipline yourself. Shut up if you can't speak faith. Don't say anything. It's a first step yes. towards changing your mind. Because when you, when, listen, I know. When you tell yourself, I'm not saying anything here, old oh, buddy, it'll cause you to start thinking. It'll cause you to retrace the reason for not saying something. It'll cause you to say, why aren't you saying something? You know you have a right to say something. You ought to say something. After all, they said something. You ought to be able to retaliate. Why? Because I'm in faith. I'm believing that what God has said will come to pass. I don't need to prove it. I don't need to make them agree with me. I just need to stay in agreement with God. The things that people see, and we all know this, are far more impressive than the things that we say. Right? Yeah. Amen? You, all of us can say this, but I'll just use Don and Jane as an example. You can talk to people about healing forever. Oh, we believe in healing. Absolutely, we believe in healing. We know that God heals. But those are words. Mm -hmm. But when they see mm -hmm. the evidence of healing, it stops the mouth of the critic. Yeah. They, can, they can't argue with the fact. They can't argue with the truth. Right. Amen? If you tell them, they can say, like it's been done to me, oh, yeah, well, that's Nathan. You know, I mean, I, know, I knew him when. And, you know, so he's... You know, I don't know that we can put a lot of confidence in what he said. No. That's why when people ask me, what should I do about this? First of all, it's not my job to tell you what to do about anything. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. That's why I always just point you to the Word of God. Yeah. You don't want my opinion, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> you do not want my opinion. Because it's just that. Yeah. And everybody's got opinions. And they change. Uh -huh. But the Word of God is settled forever. Yes. Amen. Believe it. Confess it. Stay with it. Fight the fight of faith. Live by faith. And you will see the glory of God in the days of heaven on earth. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Sorry for keeping you late this morning, but God bless you all. Have a great day. Happy birthday, Sheila. You're all dismissed in Jesus' name.